Nobius Nutrition is still physical distancing, and we're not mad about it. This is a one-hour food fight against diet culture and its fake science messages. Instead, we're passionate about celebrating real wellness. I'm registered dietitian Hannah McGee. And I'm neuroscience PhD student Tarek Youssef, and this is No BS Nutrition. It's nice to see you, Hannah. (laughs) Nice to see you too, Tara. Welcome to behind the scenes, little secret. Yes, behind the scenes. Tell them. Well, we are recording too because I'm being really demanding because I have an exam coming up, so I want a week off later. (laughs) So we're recording two in one day. Yeah, we're recording back to back episodes today, but they won't be airing back to back. No. No, we're just... I know. It's so... Pr- just pr- our production place. team is just all over the place. They're rushing. Our assistants are like running back and forth. They're, they're getting everything we're ready big and stuff. in the butt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> our, we don't have assistants. <laughs> we don't have a production company. <laughs> we are the production company. Like last we week, are and you production. were like, I wish I could tell someone to edit this out. I wish I could tell the yeah. producers to edit this out. And I was like, Tara. Edit this out. We are the producers. <laughs> we are the producers. Yeah. We are the producers. I wonder what's what's been going on in in your life in the past three minutes, Hannah. That you might want. That well, might actually, watch. one thing. I, I mean, this might be TMI, but I was so. I have an error. <laughs> <laughs> I have, this, this is good. Now that we've already recorded one episode, we're kind of loose now. So this like one's going to be really off the rails. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Um, so when we're recording our episodes virtually we're also on facetime so i have my i'm on facetime with Tarek while we're recording and i have my airpods um connected to my phone on facetime with Tarek, and and we took a like five minute break in between recording and i had to run to the washroom and i was like on my way to the washroom and i realized i still had my airpods in so if i like went to the washroom Tarek would have been able to essentially we could have just been chatting the whole time hear everything on my ear you know actually this is really interesting that you bring this up usually i'm wearing my airpods too but um uh, i'm charging them because i, I want to use them later uh i i wonder what you think of this cultural debate Okay. I recently posted an Instagram photo of myself wearing AirPods. Oh, yes. And I didn't notice the AirPods were in until after I posted the photo. Okay. And then I left a comment saying, it takes a real monster to post an Instagram photo to their grid with AirPods in. Now, what do you think of that? What do you think of posting an Instagram photo to grid with AirPods in and also the social commentary of saying that it takes a real monster to do such a thing? Like, I... (laughs) <laughs> I don't get it. Like, is, like, is that a bad thing? So to is me, it just, I like, think really obnoxious to wear your. That's what pads? I'm kind of getting. At. It's yeah, like to okay, me, yeah. it's like I. First of all, it's like um, it's also it's almost like virtue, which I'm not rich at all. It's like virtue signaling that sure. like I have money. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. Like yeah. wearing AirPods, they're really expensive. They're really expensive. It, uh, to, full disclosure, I got them as a gift. Very, very generous gift. Me Never too. would have bought something like Me that too. myself. Um, I My AirPods, actually, I got them like the first year that they came out. And I'm pretty sure that they were not a lot, but a, a little more affordable when they first came out. I, I don't okay. think they were like Three hundred dollars or whatever. You were an early adopter. <laughs> I was an early adopter, um, but they were also a gift. Um, yeah. But yeah, I agree. There is some, some sort of like obnoxiousness, I guess. To I mean, not. I guess it's just kind of like. There, there like, maybe. I don't mean to be like faux woke, but there is like deeper stuff to it too. Um, this is something that you know. Contact your local counselor. Apple refuses to make AirPods in a way that's recyclable. So currently, all AirPods will just go to landfill and um, stink up and pollute our earth because the way that they make them is not recyclable. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I know. So um, I'm part of the I'm POP part of the problem. Me too, unfortunately. (laughs) Oh man. 
<laughs> do you ever think about that like oh i wonder what's like in the background of this photo like i wonder what people think about that oh totally all the time as yeah i mean with part of the work that i do being on social media so much i'm always like i wonder what people are looking at in this photo like or what people are noticing or what people, so people yeah. won't actually be able to see right now because of the way i had it set up but um, when I told you that I needed five minutes, but I ended up only needed needing right. thirty seconds, it was because I was cleaning up a bunch of like dirty dishes and right. and plates behind me, um, which I don't even think people won't be able no, to see able it to in see the episode it. where yeah. it would have been. Um, well, but I like guess I was right thinking now, about what people thought. You can't see it on FaceTime, but on my video recording for people who would watch on YouTube, I have this like plant beside me and there's just like this dead leaf hanging off of it that is blatantly in the screen like in, in you're a bad plant owner i'm a bad plant owner canceled i'm sorry and you guys probably think that i'm super like like i'm trying to be have this aesthetic like plant in the background but it's dead so it's failing do you ever think i always think like i wonder if the judges on tv shows like how they're always behind a desk like do you think they're just like wearing slippers and like like oh. have their shoes off or like not even wearing pants just like wearing yeah, pajamas maybe. or something yeah know. yeah they're I always just sitting on a table there's so much that's not seen but sometimes they stand up Sometimes they stand up. And they're up. like clapping for the people. And they like, hit the golden buzzer yeah, and everyone's yeah, crying. Yeah. <laughs> Every, everyone's hitting the golden buzzer for this episode. They're like, oh, I know it's going to be a good one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Maybe I should dive in. Yeah, so BS of the Week, hit me. What is it? B-S-O-T dubs. Well, the BS of the Week this week, I was kind of inspired by the pandemic a little okay. bit. Mm-hmm. It's not COVID nineteen related. So okay. everyone's crying. Everyone listening is crying. Oh, no. All they want to all they want, want to hear to about is COVID nineteen. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop talking about it. But what it is inspired by is kind of um, by like cooking at home during the pandemic or like buying certain things during the pandemic. I think people are kind of shifting to purchasing a little bit differently right now they're kind of thinking a little bit more long term right so maybe thinking non-perishables for example um as something that they're stocking up on i know at least i am thinking like of i have been thinking of just like buying more non-perishables than normal um and as opposed to buying you know maybe like fresh things because i want to only go shopping like once every two weeks or something right um so it got me thinking about this myth that goes around um, that canned and frozen food is unhealthy compared Uh, to fresh. Or not as healthy, yeah. Or not as healthy. So this is something that I think a lot of people hold this kind of, it's almost like this like stigma against canned and frozen foods. Um, Even that is kind of like a, You know, when you think of like a bountiful harvest, like coming back from the farmer's market or coming back from the grocery store, that aesthetic photo of like your leafy greens and blah, blah, blah. It is beautiful. Like uh, you can definitely see the beauty in it. But I think someone would equate that to health as as opposed to like seeing a can of beans or seeing like a bag of frozen vegetables would be like, like, yeah, like that's like low class or like it's not. Right. It's not as healthy, like right. it's second rate sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So this is, in fact, completely a myth. Um, and yeah. I wanted to bring up a paper. And maybe you can also, you know, as dietitian extraordinaire that you are, can also help me get this message across. So yeah. there's this paper from Rickman and colleagues from 2007 called Nutritional Comparison of Fresh, Frozen, and Canned Fruits and Vegetables. And they were looking at... Um, a bunch of uh, different components of the um, different foods, the fruits and vegetables, some micronutrients. They were looking at vitamin A, vitamin E, minerals, fiber, etc. cetera. Um, and just like basic summary, the result, this is a direct quote, the results show that these nutrients are generally sim- similar in comparable fresh and processed products. So basically the processing here is like very minimal processing that is sometimes done to canned or 
frozen things, whether it's like a bit of chopping up or a bit of peeling yep. or so on. Yeah. So minerals and fiber, they say, are generally stable to processing, storage, and cooking, mm -hmm. but they might be lost, like I said, in peeling and other removal steps during okay. processing. Mineral uptake, so for example, calcium, or addition like sodium so sometimes sodium is added to something yeah. as kind of as part of the preservatives yeah. that keep it good inside of a can or whatever during processing they that can change the natural mineral composition of a product mm -hmm. so but the thing is like they say in the paper too sodium concerns in canned food can be addressed by choosing products with no salt added totally. the other thing is like if you also if you get a can of beans and you are somebody who's worried about their their yep. salt intake uh, for whatever reason, whether it be blood pressure or so on. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think just even rinsing yep. the, the vegetables that come out of the can, it gets rid of at least 50% of the salt that's yeah. associated with whatever was on the nutritional label. Yep, yep. Draining it and... Hinting, rinse. hinting to what we're talking about later, nutritional oh, label, yes, yes, hinting. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, draining and rinsing it absolutely gets rid of most of uh, the sodium that would be in the can. So I just this is why I kind of wanted to talk about this as the BS of the week because often um, a canned product or a frozen product is cheaper than the fresh alternative, which is maybe another reason that somebody might turn to it, not just for the sake of it being non-perishable, but for the sake of you know the finances associated with yeah. it, and especially in a time when we're trying to be at the grocery store less. Uh, and maybe we're trying to save money, whether it be because we're laid off or not able to work for whatever reason because of COVID-19, that we turn to things like frozen and canned foods because they're, in fact, you know, more, um, uh, you know, more financially agree. They agree yeah, financially yeah. with our situation right now, but they also agree with the situation where we want our food to last, last longer, longer at the moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, there's no reason to think that they're going to be less nutritionally valuable. Totally. I absolutely agree. I love that <coughs> you wanted to talk about this um, as your BS of the week because it definitely is a bit of a misconception. I think more and more people are starting to kind of get on board and recognize that there isn't a difference nutrition-wise with canned and frozen foods and actually, um, yeah, they're more affordable and why not <laughs> why not buy more affordable uh produce especially you know produce is not cheap some of the times uh, certain uh definitely things, certain things like the first thing that comes to mind for me is like berries um are for uh, us anyways where we live um you know most of the year they're imported and they come quite a long ways and they're not <laughs> they're not cheap so things totally. like frozen berries might be a lot more accessible to a lot of people and they're not any less nutritious nutritious in fact actually um it's believed that some frozen foods are actually i mean the, the difference is not huge but may retain more nutrients or they might be more nutritious than um their fresh varieties because they're flash frozen when they're at their right. like prime or when they're like ripe or yeah, like right exactly. away yeah and so they you know they don't they're fro they're flash frozen they're not going to lose any of those nutrients they're not that, sitting on a shelf that the the fresh ones might lose while they're sitting on the shelf or being transported or whatever it is so that's actually really interesting and um yes mm -hmm. i mean the the, the difference that's a great towards point. meeting your you know, your nutrition needs is obviously not huge, whether you choose fresh or frozen berries, but it definitely goes against that um, belief that they're less um, nutritious or not as good for you. Totally. And I, I don't want anyone to be like, I hope even especially right now, if anybody is being shamed into thinking that like canned or frozen is not as healthy point them to this episode or like point yeah. them to the paper that uh, we'll link yeah. in the description because it's just not true. It's just it's not, not true. true. If it agrees with your wallet right now or if you just simply prefer it, you are from a nutritional standpoint on good footing. Yeah. And I think, I think there's a sense of convenience as well that comes with canned and frozen foods that I mean, I definitely take advantage of. I think it, you know, not having to 
wash and chop or peel or whatever, like kind of taking that away, and they're a lot of times still more affordable, is really helpful in terms of fresh. Yeah, the only time that I think I've seen that I prefer uncanned is actually even something that's even less popular. Uh, but I like to buy my beans dry because it's actually even cheaper than right. um, buying canned yeah, beans. Yeah, because you don't have that. You, you get to buy them in bulk. Out of it. Yeah. Totally. And all you have to do is soak them the night before and then cook them yourself, which is like Good more time you. consuming for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> it is I more time consuming. That. It's yeah. more time consuming. But, um, yeah, but otherwise, I love. I actually prefer canned tomatoes because, like you're saying, they are um, processed at the point at which they are the ripest yeah. or like the most flavorful. The so quality. I find, yeah, I find canned tomatoes actually taste better than mm. fresh tomatoes. Sometimes it's definitely a different experience, like mushier, etc. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I guess um, it depends what you use them in. Yeah, yeah, not a salad or something like that. But <laughs> if I'm making a pasta sauce, I yeah, definitely sure. prefer oh, totally. Me too. canned tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. soup. Yeah, or soup. Yeah. Anyway, sure. that's my BS of love the week. It. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's I hope great. if anybody was holding any guilt about buying canned or frozen, like get rid of that guilt. No need for, for it. Sure. I agree. Loved that. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you. All right. So our topic today, we want to kind of talk to you guys about food labeling. I think this was a request because uh, Tarek and I had it on our list um, of potential topic ideas and mm-hmm. we could not figure out like... Who, how it got there who wrote, wrote it down <laughs> i didn't write who it came there. Up with the idea and it wasn't me either and i th- i honestly think it was when we back in i don't know when would it have been february or uh when we finished up season one we kind of put out a little question box on instagram asking for mm. some suggestions for future topics and i think someone requested food labeling maybe it was copy the beagle <laughs> Thanks, Copy. Good dog. Maybe it wasn't, though. If, if it was you, definitely let us know um, because we're addressing it today. Yeah, thank so, you. So basically what we want to talk about is kind of an overview of food, of food labeling, specifically in Canada. Uh, we'll talk about why food labels exist, what's mandatory on food labels, what's not, kind of how to navigate food labeling because there are, you know, different, different labels, I guess, that are on or different... Mm-hmm different components to food labels. You know, if you think of like the nutrition facts table and then the ingredients list and then health claims that are on food labels, those are all kind of different things and they're all regulated a little, they're all regulated, but they're regulated a little differently. Um, Right. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about just some things to look out for in terms of nutrition labels, things that might be changing in the future or have changed recently. And then we'll look at some papers that I think will be really, really interesting. You kind of told me a little bit about them before we hit record, yeah. and they sound really interesting. So I'm excited. Hope you guys are too. Um, I hope you guys yeah. find it interesting. If you have any questions, definitely ask. Um, obviously, we can't answer them in real time, but... Um, <laughs> We're listening. Call yeah. in now. Yeah. <laughs> I would love that. Okay. <laughs> so, Yeah. Um, let me see. Let me, where do I want to start? I guess I'll start with, you know, why food labels exist. And, and really it's um, to help Canadians make informed decisions about the foods that they eat. That's, the, you know, the main purpose of, of food labels. Is and to, if you're listening from outside of Canada, we do have one listener in Belgium. If you're oh. Belgian people, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Um, yes, not just Canadians. They're, they exist Yes, to, to inform you about the food that's in the packaging that, you know, you're looking at in the grocery store or might pick up at the grocery store. So you can use this information for a lot of reasons, whether, you know, you want to make informed choices about, you know, healthy eating or you have allergies and you want to know what's in your food. Um, there, there's a lot of reasons. Um, you have specific a specific condition where you might need to you know, be looking to add something to your diet or maybe avoid something in your diet. Um, food labels can absolutely help with all of those things. So what's mandatory on food labels? Um, a nutrition facts table. And this, sorry, all prepackaged foods must have a nutrition facts table. Right. Yeah, not all foods. Prepackaged foods have to have a nutrition facts table, an ingredients list, and then they may also have nutrition or health claims, but these things are optional. 
And then not all foods require a nutrition label. So there are some prepackaged foods that don't require a label um, and foods in general, I think. Yeah, so fresh fruits and vegetables, obviously, um, there's no labels on those when you're at the grocery store. Um, raw meat, poultry, fish, and seafood um, are not required. Uh, prepared Foods prepared or processed at the store that they're being sold Mm -hmm. Um, so if you think of like the bakery section of your grocery store or something like that if the foods are prepared and or processed and then packaged there they're not required to have um, labels like nutrition facts tables and things like that so um, uh, yeah like bakery items or if you think about like maybe sausages or pre-made salads those don't have to have labels And then foods that contain very few nutrients. So tea, coffee, spices, those things don't have to have labels and then, or nutrition labels. Yeah. And then alcohol as well. So if Mm. most, you know, alcohol bottles and things like that don't. Oh yeah. I've never seen a nutrition label on a bottle of alcohol. Yeah. You know what? Some, some do not, it's not like bottles of like spirits, but now, and like beer, beer, I, you know, was one thing to me that I remember like looking at and being like oh there's no label on this Mm. um but some uh, like ready to drink beverages so like maybe like a there's lots of different varieties of like oh like a vodka vodka soda yeah a lot of those are not all of them but a lot of them are starting to include nutrition labels and i think it's probably because they're coming from like a healthier perspective like they they want to show how, like yes. how low the calorie intake yeah, is. Exactly. Like they want to show there's no sugar. Or they want to show there's no there's like they're low in calories or or they want to show that they're all natural ingredients or whatever it is. Um, so they actually have a I mean this is really interesting but they have a a biased reason possibly for yeah, exactly. putting they, a food label on there. They're not required to, but they um, are doing it anyways. It's kind of like mm. a marketing it's like a Definitely marketing, a marketing um, thing. Yeah. 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 And then restaurants and food service businesses are also not required to have um, nutrition labels attached to their products as well. I mean, you bring up a really interesting point there because it goes to show, like, for the consumer, we always need to be... I mean, we don't have to stress ourselves out over this and, like, painstakingly go through every every decision in our lives Mm -hmm. and, like, question everything to, like, infinitesimal degrees. But, you know, it goes to show, as a consumer, like, we are sometimes being given information not out of like a, like a not from like a benevolent perspective where mm-hmm. someone is sharing information with us because like we deserve that information but sometimes they're actually trying to sway our decision making mm, because yeah. of it yeah for sure yeah. interesting it's a good point so um just a little bit on regulation health canada in canada health canada is um who regulates food labeling through the Food and Drug Act. And we'll link that um, if anyone wants to take a look at the Food and Drug (laughs) Act, if you're interested, you can take a look. Their their website crashes because everyone goes to (laughs) (laughs) read it. Yeah. Um, So we won't dive into that too much, but I just thought that was, um, might be of interest to some people. Now, in terms of, so I can kind of dive into a little bit, a little more detail about the different, labels so Mm. obviously first and um probably most popular is the nutrition facts table so the nutrition facts table is you know it's the usually on the back of a product or maybe the side and it it, you know states at the top nutrition facts so it's pretty easy to identify usually black and white black and white yeah um it's it's there it's meant to teach you about you know the nutrients and um the energy or calories that are provided in that specific food or product um it's supposed to make it easier for people to compare similar foods so maybe you're looking at two different pastas or two different salsas or whatever and there's specific things you want to look for you can kind of use the nutrition facts table to make a comparison between the two products um you can oh sorry i just clicked on something that i didn't mean to click on um (laughs) it it's meant to help you or allow you to look for foods um that have maybe you're looking for a specific nutrient or something to have a lot of something you know nutrition facts tables can help you identify that so maybe you you want something that's 
has at least 30 grams of carbs. Um, you can mm. use the nutrition facts table to look for a specific nutrient. And then it can also help you select foods if you're on a specific or special diet for some reason. It can kind of help with that as well. Um, maybe for some reason, you know, you need to avoid, again, like we've talked about before, you, you need to watch out for sodium or things like that. Um, nutrition mm-hmm. facts tables can help you do that. So nutrition facts tables must include the serving size. So that's usually at the top. Um, and it, it tells you what a serving of that specific product is. There's been a little bit of, I guess, can you still hear me? Yeah. I think one of my AirPods just died. Um, but one of them still is still good. Okay, so, still going. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Oh. And the so, serving size. Yeah, so the serving size. So that's something that I'll get to the changes around um, nutrition labels, but that's something that's been mm. addressed because... I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but on some nutrition facts tables, the serving size is very or was very confusing. Like it might say per 325 mils and you're which is like the whole bottle. Yeah. Or yeah. You're like, what is this? Or or maybe like a carton of milk was like a single serving carton of milk. Mm -hmm. But then the the serving size on the nutrition facts table said like per 125 mils or something like that. Like, do you know what I mean? I've definitely seen that there's been differences before. Yeah, so that's one thing that they're looking at changing, kind of making those serving sizes a little more realistic for people or a little easier to understand. And standardizing them, I guess, between products. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's uh, that's one thing. Um, Obviously, you know, different nutrients as well as calories are listed on the nutrition facts table. the percent daily value. So we'll touch on that a little bit in a second, um, what that means and and how you can use that. And then I mentioned nutrients, but there are 13 core nutrients that are listed on a nutrition facts table. So those are fat, saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, sodium, carbohydrates, fiber, sugar, protein, and then vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium, and iron. But Again, those are some things that may be changing, those last right. um, four. So that is required to be kind of, or not kind of, but required to be consistent across all food products that have nutrition facts tables. That is like okay. the template or the, that nutrition facts tables must follow. Right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's a pretty general kind of rundown of nutrition facts tables. Yeah, that was um, really good. Again, so you can, I'm just trying to see what my notes say. I want to, I really, I think the most important thing I want to touch on is the percent daily value because that's something that people might not really understand or know what to do with. So the percent mm-hmm. daily value essentially is meant to show you if a food has a lot or a little of a nutrient. Because if you look at something and it says 100 milligrams of sodium, that to, mm-hmm. to a lot of people, doesn't mean much or you you might not know how to interpret you know an amount or you know 100 milligrams of sodium you're like i don't know if that's a little or if that's sure. a lot right yeah so that's kind of where the percent daily value comes in and, and how it can be helpful so typically the general rule is if something is five percent or less dv or daily value that's a little that's that food contains a little of this nutrient. So if, if the percentage of sodium is 5% or less, it contains a little sodium. If the package says 15% DV or more, that typically means a lot. There's there's a mm-hmm. lot of that nutrient. So if there's 17% DV of sodium, that's, right. you know, that might be- Because it's like per serving as well. It's and whatever food yeah. package that you have might have more than one serving in it. Right. So everything on um, everything on the label, all the numbers are per that serving size that's listed at the top. Because if you have one serving of it and it's fifteen percent, maybe that's not that's not like a tremendously large amount. But if you end up having two, you're already at thirty yeah. percent of your daily value. Yeah. Exactly. Of whatever that. Yeah. Whatever that nutrient is. And the I mean, obviously, everyone is very unique, so it's not. You know, it's not an exact science, but it's based on what the like of your total nutrient requirements for the day or the, the limit that's recommended. That percentage is, is how much is in that one serving um, out of how much you should be eating in a day. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So say there's, um, the recommendation is 23, no more than 2,300 milligrams of sodium a day, that 17% would be out of that 2,300. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then um, the, uh, on the nutrition label, um, the, the nutrients listed at the bottom, so that um, vitamin A, vitamin C, iron, calcium, those are things, those are on the label because I think initially they were things that were believed um, people didn't get enough of, so people should try to get more of them. But now, like I said, some of those are changing because it has been seen that um, things like vitamin A and vitamin C are actually nutrients that people don't have trouble meeting or don't have trouble getting right. enough of. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. We don't have a lot of scurvy these days. No, exactly. Yeah. Um, so those we'll mention that when we talk about the changes. Um, and then there's certain ones that you know, typically are recommended to try to get less of. So things like saturated and trans fats, um, usually sodium and cholesterol. Those are things that we usually want to try to limit. So um, that's kind of, you know, that's why they're on the nutrition facts table. So you can make informed decisions about products containing those things. So I think that is... That's most of what I want to talk about in terms of nutrition facts tables. I'll just... That's a really good introduction. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll touch on the ingredient list now just briefly. So the ingredient list obviously lists everything um, or all the ingredients that are in the product. So the ingredients are listed in order by weight um, with the heaviest ingredient listed first and then the lightest ingredient listed last. So essentially the first ingredient that that product or that food contains the most of that ingredient. So maybe in like a baked product, it's wheat flour. Um, mm -hmm. And then I don't, mean, I don't know what the last thing would be, but maybe it's like some sort of flavoring or something. Flavoring. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's <clears throat> might be helpful for some people to know. Um, again, these might be helpful if you have something, you know, a food allergy or an intolerance or something that you need to avoid certain ingredients. Um, that's where ingredients lists might be helpful or, you know, I think they can be helpful in a lot of ways. Maybe a lot of times, <coughs> I mean, I don't think we need to be super strict around it, but it's nice to know, or, you know, maybe watch out for a lot of, I don't know, certain things that might be added to your food. We, you know, we typically recommend less ingredients, um, right. you know, in terms of eating more whole foods, things with less ingredients are usually or foods that are, you know, considered whole foods like fruits and vegetables or your your whole grain bread products, they don't have a ton of ingredients unless maybe there's like raisins added to your bagel or something like that. But Right. And um, they also retain more of the nutrients that were originally like part of that food because yeah. they've been less processed. Right. Or exactly. they haven't been processed at all. Right. They exactly. haven't been peeled, they haven't been cut, they haven't been whatever cooked or whatever. Totally. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just need to take a sip of water here. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. All right. Um, so that's ingredients list, just general. I mean, not really too, too much to talk about there. And then mm. nutrition claims. So nutrition claims are, you know, nutrient content claims. So like, you know, this is a good source of vitamin Omega C or whatever. or whatever. Yeah. And then health claims as well. So health claims are like a statement that mentions certain nutrients and then their role in health or like disease prevention or something like that. So maybe there would be a health claim that says a healthy diet low in saturated and trans fats may reduce the risk of heart disease. And then they mm. would name that food item that, you know, the label is on is low in saturated and trans fats. And that would be right on the product. Yeah. It would be right Written on the right box on or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, um, in terms of the nutrient, um, the nutrient claims, so it could say like high in vitamin C. It doesn't really talk about the benefits of vitamin C, but say it says high in vitamin C, um, or it, there's other wording that it, it could have. So if you're looking, say you want to um, increase your vitamin C intake, you might look for something that says high in vitamin C, source of vitamin C, good source of vitamin C. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a difference between source and good source. Good source would mean, um, you know, it's high in, so it has more than 15% of that daily value. Oh, interesting. Source okay. of could just be like, it could be it's 5%, there. more than 5%. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it's right. not a lot of it. So that's something mm. to note. 
Um, and then I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. So if you're looking to decrease the amount of certain things, you might look for like free of um, or sugar free. Like say you didn't want added sugar or sorry, no sugar at all. It might say sugar free. Um, if it's low in again, so 5% of that daily value or less, it could say low in sugar or low in saturated fat and then reduced. So that just means um, the amount in it has been lessened. Like say there's two different um, two different Campbell's tomato soups and one is reduced sodium and one is just regular. It just means that, it doesn't mean that the product or the tomato soup is necessarily low in sodium. It just means that the amount compared to the original has been reduced. Right. Yeah. So very, it can be confusing, I think, for some people yeah. navigating all of those claims and um, maybe thinking that just because something says it's reduced, it's low in it. Or just because, you know, something says it's a source of means that it's a good source of it, you know? So it's, it's really hard to to kind of navigate sometimes, I think, when you're, when you're I agree. shopping. We're very bombarded with labels and claims. So Lots of claims, this is yeah. A little bit, I don't know, helpful for you guys. It is, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So um, let me just see if there's anything. I, I, I guess in about the health claims, um, let me just see. I, I had like another yeah. kind of page of notes about them, but I might have already kind of covered it in my little spiel. Whenever I think of them, I always think of um, like, I especially see those kinds of things in the cereal aisle, I think. Yeah. The health claims, especially when it gets to like, the healthier branded versions right. of cereals yeah. that's where my mind goes yeah i for sure you know the whole grains and the fiber and things like that there's definitely a lot of um health claims around those things for sure i don't think i think i covered everything i wanted to talk about nice. maybe Tarek, if you want to um let's hear your papers and yeah then I, can I have a couple of little on, papers um, here I'll talk about the changes to food labeling maybe after you talk Perfect. about papers. Yeah, okay, sounds That good. sounds great. Um, so the first one that I wanted to talk about is called Nutrition Labels on Prepackaged Foods, a Systematic Review. So it was a review, obviously, of a bunch of other literature about food labels. This is from 2011. So why did they do this study here? They wanted to understand the consumer use and understanding of nutrition labels, which we've kind of been hinting at already, and the impact on dietary habits. So they reviewed about 120 articles from all over the world with lots of diverse subjects. Um, so obviously, you know, we can make nutrition labels like you're saying, and we can put lots of information on them, but how do people actually use that information? And what do they understand mm -hmm. out of it? So we need to do those studies. They're really important. So what did they find? So people, when they think of a nutrition label, they think of it as a credible source of information. So there's, it's something that they're definitely, they're trusting which I think puts even more onus on the uh, bodies that regulate nutrition labels because if people are trusting them as their primary source of information about nutrition, then they better darn well be appropriately yeah. made and contain uh, truthful, honest information, right? Mm -hmm. So people do indeed, people are using them to guide their food selection. Yeah. And it seems like people who use food labels more often tend to at least self-identify as having healthier diets. Okay. So the when you they've also looked at this kind of uh, information with respect to demographics and it seems that women tend to use food labels more often than men uh, and women more often report that food labels factor into their food selection. Neat. I mean this may be a kind of unfortunately maybe kind of like a vicious cycle thing of like women are pressured more to pay attention to what they're eating yeah for sure so that might be what's driving the food label use yeah and i think that <clears throat> food i mean reading food labels is definitely something i mean as a dietitian that i know is a part of eating well and like education around eating well. So when we are educating, you know, maybe someone comes in to see you in your clinic or whatever, and um, they've been referred to learn about healthy eating or make, you know, learning how to make um, more nutritious choices. That's something that probably would have been discussed with them. So it definitely makes sense to me that 
people who associate or who you know claim to be healthy eaters are the people who read food labels because it is very interesting. i mean it can be a really good thing obviously like you're saying it can it's very i mean it's kind of like that gentle dental nutrition push like reading a food label and learning more about what you're eating is actually a really positive thing i agree i just yeah i mean I've definitely seen the other end of the spectrum as well. That's what I like mean. It's like an yeah. obsession on it. Yeah. And that's exactly. not good either. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, the, the study also found that people with low income are less likely to use nutrition labels. Mm-hmm. Um, so it seems to me, so I'm kind of, they didn't really address this further in the paper, but it seems to me there's cl- clearly a level of privilege that can come with totally. nutrition label use. Yeah, that's the first thing that came to my mind when you said that. Whether that's education level or uh, socioeconomic status, I think... Yeah, because I mean, if like, something is like the only product you can afford or it's the one that's on sale, you're not exactly. going to look at the label, you're going to buy it. Like if you're... Yeah. I mean, to me, I still look at the price first on a lot of things. And oh, I'm uh, assuming like people with low income are... You know, yes, of course, there's probably they probably want to eat well, they probably want to be healthy, but probably the price factors in a lot higher than Absolutely. you know the micronutrient yep. daily value that's yep. in the serving. Yep. Um, they also talk about race in this paper too, but I think it's it's a really fraught over generalization to say that one race uses labels over another i think socioeconomics play a huge role into it as well because obviously race intersects with um, socioeconomic status and intersects with privilege a lot so it's a really but but i guess it's important to know that you know people depending on their demographics are going to use food labels differently because if governments or you know as i guess especially if governments want to promote healthy eating or if they want to promote the use of food labels they really do need to look at what populations they are not serving mm, great point so this is really good research to do and i i'd love i'd love for us to one day talk i mean we talked about this in the last episode but talking to somebody about the intersection of socioeconomics and yes you know, d- demographic factors on nutrition. Uh, yeah, determinants of health. Yeah. Determinants of health, really interesting topic. So there's also a lower use of food labels among children, which maybe isn't that surprising. No. Children might be paying attention to other things, whether it's the label, the brand, yeah. uh, sorry, rather, um, or whether it's something familiar to them or not. Mm-hmm. And maybe this is why something like the traffic light system of food labeling has been gaining a little bit of popularity. So kind of that front of package, if you've ever seen it before, red, yellow, green uh, labeling, which is where the analogy with traffic lights come in, where green is like, this is really healthy. It might have like a a very low percentage of sodium, let's say, and then that would be green. But the same product might also have a higher percentage of cholesterol, which might be yellow or red on the front of the package, which kind of gives an overgeneralization of like, you know, this product mostly has green things. So it's probably going to be, quote, healthier. It's very overgeneralized. That reminds me of um, also, I know that um, Loblaws or, or like, yeah, Loblaws chain stores. I don't know if they still do, but when I was in, nutri- in my nutrition degree, I, I volunteered with a grocery store or in-store dietitian, and part of her, when she did, um, she would do tours, and, and one of the tours she did was like school tours, so she'd have, mm-hmm. you know, elementary-aged kids come in and do a grocery store tour with her and she, i've she, been on one of those when i was oh, really? a kid yeah yeah and she would make like you know then they'd come back to the kitchen and make like a fun recipe together and or decorate something or whatever and one of the things that they had in, in the loblaw stores were like the star system i don't know if you remember yeah, that where i vaguely remember it yeah so they'd have like the, the blue stars and it was out of, i think it was out of five stars so like you know the, the healthier the food um, the more stars it would have. So, you know, obviously the things in like the produce section, the fresh produce or even frozen produce and things like that would have five stars. They were things that, you know, you should be looking to buy more Incorporating of. in your diet. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the less nutritious things. So maybe like the chips or things like that might have 
lower amounts of stars so one star or something like that so that was that interesting just reminded me of that the the lighting system kind of reminds so we were just talking about kind of the popularity of these other kinds of food labels front of package food labels that maybe are another way to get an easier or quicker glance at the nutritional components of a product like the traffic light system or like the stars right and those might be gaining popularity so mm -hmm. Overall, this study that I was reading, kind of the conclusion that it comes to is that governments might want to consider new formats or different types of content on food labels to make sure that nutritional information is accessible and understandable right. to all kinds of people, um, whether whatever sociodemographic status they hold or whatever race they are and so on. They even mentioned something which I wouldn't have thought about if they hadn't brought it up, but... Um, the idea that menus should start incorporating nutrition labels mm. on their products as well. Some restaurant menus do have little, almost like a traffic light system maybe, where they might have like a green check or whatever next to certain food items indicating that they're maybe low calorie and so yep. on. But they don't really get into like the specific nutritional information of their I know products. in some provinces like I'm I'm pretty sure in Ontario it's required to have the the calories at least in restaurants wow. of I didn't know in, that of a dish yeah I, I don't know if there's anything more than calories like fat or protein or carbs anything like that is required but um calories at least from what I remember when I lived there in 2016, 2017, all the restaurants, I'm pretty sure, or like fast food places and things like that had, maybe they didn't have to, or but they were, a lot of them did. I'm pretty sure though, it was like, it was a rule that they, or a, like a law that they had wow. to include it. Yeah. And there's a lot of kind of controversy around that and whether or not that should be included because I mean. Well, on it, its own, it's kind of like, okay that's the calorie amount but to me i feel like i'm more interested in some other nutritional mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. i i mean i agree but i think a lot of where a lot of people are at um if they see something that's high in calories they automatically assume that it's unhealthy right um or you know they're always they're looking for the lower calorie option and and i, I do think it kind of reduces food or dishes to calories right right um totally and and we know that food is so much more i mean obviously energy is important but there are a lot of other things you know found in food that we need to think about too definitely yeah that's Anyways, really interesting yeah. this other article that i had um that uh, i can just briefly go through is called consumer effects of front of package nutrition labeling <laughs> An interdisciplinary meta-analysis. This one is more recent. It's from 2019. It's actually a marketing article. Um, so it was published in a journal about marketing science. Oh, interesting. Um, so why did they do it? They wanted to find out which front of package labels, so kind of those traffic light systems, the stars we were mentioning earlier. Sometimes there's those blue checks mm -hmm. on certain cereals or other products. Which front of pa package labels work best to change people's perception and behaviors? And they looked at 114 other articles that were addressing front of package labels. So what did they find? So basically, there's two kinds of categories of front of package labels. There's ones that they call reductive, which are you know basically they're just nutrient specific okay. i know what mine looks like on my box of oatmeal for example it yeah. has like the serving amount how many calories are in each serving the amount oh, of yes, sugar okay. yep. um, it's just those like little circles with usually black and white that have very very basic nutritional information and on the front of the label right on the front of the yeah. label you would find the same information if you looked at the nutrition yeah. panel on the back but it's rather it's i guess easier to see maybe on the shelf you don't have to pick up the product and, and turn it around own. yeah exactly and it kind of picks out maybe the most whatever the manufacturer thinks is the most pertinent nutritional yep. information and yep. puts it on the front of the package um there's also uh, another kind of front of package labeling called interpretive labels so these can be nutrient specific um uh, but they're really 
they interpret the information in a different way. So it's like those traffic lights. So not only do they give the nutrient information, but they're also going to associate it with a red, yellow, or green color to kind of kind of try to get the consumer to think that this is a good, okay, or bad uh, quality of kind the of food like, product. Kind of like almost like a health claim but without the words like exactly yeah. totally so there's these interpretive and these reductive front of package mm. food labels so they they kind of they looked at both of these food labels um so front of package labels they found helped consumers identify healthier products but they didn't always necessarily convince the shoppers to choose the healthier options so overall Though they did find that it does actually steal attention away from the tr- nutrition facts label on the back. So people end up relying more on the upfront information, the front of package food label, than they do on the nutritional facts label. Okay. So this is kind yeah. of brings up the, I guess, the question of whether or not that's okay. Like, is just relying on the very basic selected information that's on the front of the package enough for a consumer is that enough nutritional information Uh, there needs to be clear regulations on how the upfront information um, is selected uh, because obviously we don't want to be misleading to consumers right right so we can't just abandon the nutrition facts label on the back um, if we think that the front of package food labels are just not enough right So basically, this paper comes to the conclusion that way more research needs to be done. Mm -hmm. I mean, from my own perspective, while I was reading the paper, a lot of the relationships they made, like whether or not someone was more convinced of um, a certain food or whether they thought it was healthier, whether they wanted to choose it, so on, whether they relied more on the front of package food Mm -hmm. label than the nutrition facts label on the back. Those relationships were statistically kind of weak. I think that is probably not surprising because it's kind of like a psychology behavioral thing that they're looking at here the people are very individually very different obviously they have different biases they have different demographic statuses that might you know bias them to one thing or another so obviously the relationships are going to be weak but it does i guess point out that a lot more research needs to be done before in order to inform regulations that obviously we need because we don't want to be misleading consumers about nutrition no absolutely yeah yeah that's all i've got i love that i always love your you pick such great papers oh thank you that means a lot thank you (laughs) um so yeah i mean one thing really the last thing i kind of wanted to touch on because it's it's something to look out for is food labeling changes because Mm -hmm. I mean, food labels, they do, it takes a while to implement changes, but, um, you know, they are always looking at ways that they can make them better or more easy to understand um, or more easy I mean, especially to use. now that we know a lot of people don't find them understandable and a lot right. of people don't use them. Exactly, exactly. So just some things to look out for. I believe, I believe, so I'll link this, um, this page from Health Canada, but... I believe it's from 2016 um, and they, they do, so what I want to say is at the top of the page they say that the food industry has a transition period of five years to make these changes. So they did say that some of them, you know, you could see as early as 2017, but then, you know, some of them you, you might not see until 2021. So just oh, want people to keep in mind that some of these changes may already have been implemented and some you may not see yet. So. Um, Some of the things that um, have recently been changed on the nutrition facts table. uh, So I touched on this, but making the serving size more consistent so that it's easier to compare similar foods. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, because again, if you're say you're comparing two different boxes of pasta, the serving size could be different. And so so it's really difficult to make that comparison between um, a cup of dry pasta and right. three quarters of a cup of cooked pasta. You're it like, forces the what? consumer to do some math. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Which it, is not know, always easy on the fly. No, not at all. Like trying to figure out, so how much pasta is this, you know, dry? How much does this much dry pasta make cooked pasta? And then like 
figuring out from there what three quarters of a cup, you know, comparing three quarters of a cup to a cup. And it's, it's hard and not something that people necessarily want to be doing while they're standing in the grocery store aisle. So right. it, it makes the shopping, you know, process a little more tedious, a little more difficult. Of course. And I think it's already stressful for some people. So Definitely. I, think it, I think it's good that they're trying to make that um, a little easier. And then uh, along with that, in terms of serving size, they are going going to or have changed it, I'm not 100% sure, try to make it more realistic so that it reflects the amount that Canadians, so again, this is Health Canada, um, typically eat in one sitting. Okay, because yeah, I don't eat 13 chips. Right, exactly. Like, are they going to change that? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's something that they're looking at in terms of... Because all the serving are, sizes for snack food, yeah, for chips, and like especially are like thing. it's like for four crackers. I'm like, yeah, are okay. you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's good. That's that's a good change for sure. Um, again, because you don't want to, if you're trying to encourage people to make informed decisions about what they're eating, you have to simplify it and make it a little easier. And you're you know? right. Make it realistic. Yeah. 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 So that's, um, those are some things to look out for. That's really interesting. Thank Um, you for sharing that. What else do we have? Um, Making the information on serving size and calories easier to find and read by increasing the font for serving size. Oh, that's um, huge. Calories, adding, Especially for visually impaired people. Yeah, and then adding a bold line underneath calories. I think that's something that may already be implemented. Mm. Oh, maybe not. I think so. I feel like I've seen that before. But... Um, on this page that I'll link, they have actually a comparison of like what what the old um, or original nutrition facts label looks like, and then mm. what the one with all the changes would look like. So it's kind of nice to have that visual. Yeah. And then let me see, um, revising the percent daily values based on updated science. I'm not 100% sure what they mean by that. Um, maybe just like in updated science, like food science of oh sure the products yeah yeah and right. you know, making sure they're up to date with what's actually in i'm sure as technology develops there's better um yeah yeah ways to measure those kinds of nutrients for sure inside foods um adding a percent daily value for total sugars that was something that um wasn't originally included um Mm. having you know they they listed how much sugar was in a product but they didn't list um the percentage percent, of you yeah. know, how much you should be eating is in right. the food. So that's I think I've nice. noticed that before, yeah. Yeah. I, another thing that I, I know in some places they may include it, but I don't it's not required to use um, on the nutrition facts table, but added sugars. So so mm-hmm. you can kind of differentiate between naturally occurring sugars in a product and added sugars. Um, right. I think that is on some nutrition facts labels, but again it's not something that's required. Um, what else? Um, oh yeah. So something that updating the list of, um, important nutrients, I talked about this, about vitamin A and vitamin C. So mm-hmm. they're, they are removing vitamin A and vitamin C because most Canadians get enough of these nutrients in their diet. And then they're adding potassium because it's important for maintaining things like healthy blood pressure and most Canadians don't get enough of it. So that's kind of neat. Mm. And then... Interesting. Um, adding amount in milligrams for potassium, calcium, and iron because it was for, I mean, for calcium and iron that were already on there. They just had the percent daily value. It didn't show how many milligrams were in there. So they're adding that. Right. And then adding a footnote at the bottom um, of the nutrition facts table about percent daily value. So to kind of give you a better idea of how to utilize it and that idea that 5% or less is a little and 15% is more. So they kind of nice. added a little note there just to kind of help people use that a little bit better so yeah that's the nutrition facts table i know we're um getting really close to our time we're at an hour aren't we but Mm -hmm. there are some changes maybe i'll just note around the ingredients list as well so they're going to start grouping sugars um based on or sugar based ingredients um in brackets after the name sugars so that's Mm. really helpful i think okay because you know sugar can come in a lot of different forms and have a lot of different names and people don't necessarily know how to identify them so they're going to start um writing sugars and then in brackets they will list the types of sugars that are in the product which is kind of neat um and then listing food colors by their individual common names making the text 
in black font on white or neutral background on ingredients list. That's actually That's really good. helpful because sometimes it's very hard to read. Definitely. Um, and yeah, creating minimum um, type height requirements for the ingredients. Again, making it a little more easier to read um, and using bullets or commas to separate ingredients. These are great. It really seems like they're trying to make it a little more easy for people to, to read them. Totally. They, they do. Sometimes they're very hard to find and they're very hard to, um, they're such small um, font that it's really hard to identify. Um, yeah. So I think that's most of them for the ingredients list. We already talked about serving size. Um, yeah, that's really most that's of the awesome. changes. But like I said, I'll, I'll link this interesting little piece from Health Canada about all the changes in the show notes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. That's really great. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope everyone finds it helpful. But moving right along, Tarek, why don't you tell me what's been tasty for you again? Well, my tasty, <laughs> my tasty this week is, um, you know, it's, you know, because of, you know, how difficult the times have been, whatever, I've been trying to think of like things that might make me happy to cheer me up, you know, outside of my routine that I'm mm-hmm. trying to develop for my schoolwork. Okay, my cat. Okay, hi. Oh, I tried to Aww. make it so that she couldn't get up. Spooky, you're in my business, dear. Spooky okay. wants to cuddle. Um, sorry, everyone who's listening. <laughs> um, so my Tasty This Week is one of my favorite movies. Actually, I think this is my favorite movie. Is This might be so cheesy. My favorite movie know. is is um, Four Weddings and a Funeral. Have you ever seen it? No. Oh, now it's I my favorite it. movie. It's my favorite. It's like early 90s Hugh Grant with amazing hair <laughs> and... It, and his like group of friends and they all have their own quirks and they go to four weddings and one funeral wow. obviously and it's just the best movie it's a rom-com but like when rom-coms were like like when rom-coms were good like before right. rom-coms were like i don't know like all new- exactly the same yeah and you know like yeah it was just it's such a good movie I have to, is there somewhere I can watch it? Do you know? Or? You know, actually, if you're Canadian, which you are, I'm talking to the <laughs> listeners. If you're <laughs> if you're Canadian, um, CTV has it like for free online. Oh, awesome! If I'm you just like it. search four weddings and a funeral okay. CTV, it's Perfect. free to watch. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna watch that like tonight. It's my great. favorite movie. Oh, I love it so much. Oh, I love that. It just makes you feel like. It's like a hug. It's like a warm right. hug, that movie. I yeah. think we could all use a warm hug right now. So yeah. if anyone else listening or watching hasn't um, hasn't seen it, go ahead. Watch yeah. it tonight. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, for What's me... What's been tasty for you? Oh, yeah. Thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to go ahead and tell you anyways. But um, for me, it's, it's something food related. But something I have been absolutely loving. Everyone's gasping. Everyone's like, oh my God. (laughs) Um, Something I've been absolutely loving lately, usually in the evenings when I'm watching TV or watching a movie, is popcorn with good old, it's not not homemade, it is from the little bottle, dill pickle seasoning. Oh, (laughs) that is, if you're you're a 90s kid, dill pickle seasoning on popcorn, that is lit. Like, go to the movie theater, getting that packet, getting the packet. I still do it every time I go to the movies. Dill pickle seasoning, yeah. It's so good. So, um, we... I don't know. I kind of went through like a microwave popcorn thing a couple weeks ago. Like I really just was loving microwave popcorn as my little evening snack. And do you um, use that? Did I? I'm like vaguely remembering. Did I give you for your birthday one time? That yes, I use. Is that what you use? No, not anymore. I use it all the time. It was actually when I was living in Toronto that you gave it to me, and I used it every time I made popcorn. That was so long ago. In one of our moves or something like that, it got broken. Oh, okay. My lid is broken on mine, but I still use it. Actually, it doesn't work as well. But yeah, Yeah. I need a new lid. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think the lid had broken initially, and then, but I still used it, and then the bowl it ended up breaking as well. (laughs) Okay. Um, But I did love it. How do you Um, make your microwave popcorn? Oh, from packets. Literally in the package. Okay, love, love. (laughs) You put the package in the. Um, microwave but yeah. um 
Yeah, we bought like a giant box of like, I don't know how many bags of microwave popcorn yeah. one time we went to the grocery store and it's still going strong. In that our dill pantry. pickle seasoning. Oh and my God. And I add God. the dill pickle seasoning. I love it. But the only thing that we've kind of decided maybe for the next time we buy microwave popcorn is that we'll buy like plain microwave popcorn. Because it's too much. No, no, no. With, okay. No, it's not too much. <laughs> With the seasoning? Oh, okay. Never mind. Uh, we'll buy plain. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I'm getting so excited over here. I'm knocking my ah. phone over. Um, and then add our own butter, like kind of melt our own sure. butter and drizzle some on, and then add the seasoning. Because with the butter flavored popcorn, it's dry. Like it's not wet butter, right? It's dry. Uh, and yes. so the seasoning That's a good doesn't point. stick as well. That's a good point. So it all just kind of like falls to the bottom of the bowl. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. And you're like you trying thing. to wipe your finger on yeah, it yeah, <laughs> to get exactly. it. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's, I think, what we're going to do next time. By the That's a hot popcorn. tip. Yeah, hot tip. Drizzle <laughs> your own butter on top. Yeah. And then season with the dill pickle seasoning. Um, my, that's, the, by, by the way, that's probably the best tasty we've ever had. Woo. Yeah, that's probably that you win the award. And I'll quickly just say, I know we're, I mean, this, let's not kid ourselves. This podcast is not, is not afraid of a one hour and 12 minute episode. No, so it's like, I don't know why I'm pretending. Yeah. But my favorite homemade popcorn thing is microwave popcorn whichever way you do um add butter which yeah. we do at home and then we i do this is my friend emily shout out drizzle yeah. honey on top mix Ooh. that in and then b- cracked black pepper oh my god i know it sounds it is lit it, it it's I amazing have to try that yeah it's so good i'm gonna try anyway it. love it all right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Um, definitely subscribe to the podcast if you haven't. Leave us, please, a rating and review. You know what? We need to give you guys an incentive or something to leave us a rating and review because we love reading them. Maybe yeah. We'll start sharing them. Like, the oh, why haven't we done that? Actually, yeah, that's a really great idea. Sharing them. We're gonna post them on social media. Give you a shout out. So please leave us a rating and review. And follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share with your friends. I can't tell you enough how much it actually costs money to have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like people don't know that. It anyway, is an expense. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really glad people are listening. Copy. Love you, kid. Yeah. Uh, hope Roxanne. hope you're chasing that we ball. Talk about you. We talked about Roxanne. Yeah. Roxanne. Hope Copy's chasing that ball. Hope Roxanne's writing those books. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, thank you for listening, other. everyone. <laughs> 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 okay, well, the list just keeps getting bigger. Hope Absolutely, to every time we need to say goodbye to everyone. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, yeah, we'll talk to you guys next week. Bye. Bye.